Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 647 for June 25th, 2017. Coming up in a few minutes. We can go from light, smooth whiskey to 100% rise like Lot 40. Uh, and bring in those tastes, what consumers are looking for. Just even this week, as I personally went through it this week, a lot of the consumers that were, that were on our trip with Edible uh, Canada, man, I didn't really think of Canadian whiskey that way, and I'm going to go home and buy a bottle, and I think it, it, we're starting to wake up a little bit. Dr. Don Livermore of Corby's Hiram Walker Distillery has been touring northern Canada, and I mean Arctic Circle-level northern Canada at times this week, as part of the run-up to Canada Day this coming Saturday and the 150th anniversary of Canada's Confederation. He created a special edition of J.P. Weiser's for the 150th anniversary and has been pairing it with local cuisine along the way. We'll catch up with Don Livermore later on WhiskeyCast In-Depth. And we'll look at politics south of the 49th parallel, too, the Trump administration's proposed federal budget for next year has whiskey distillers looking to Capitol Hill to restore key programs the White House wants to eliminate. I'll also have the calendar of events, this week's Your Voice, and the What I'm Tasting This Week department all coming up on this week's Whiskey Cast. You don't need a special occasion to celebrate with something truly unique. But a personally engraved bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label can make any occasion special. Support for WhiskeyCast comes from Johnny Walker. Visit johnnywalker.com to find out more about engraving options near you. WhiskeyCast. Brought to you by Redbreast. The definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, know Redbreast. Let's get started with the week's news. It's brought to you by Highland Park. It's only been a couple of months since we last reported on the sale of a distillery. But now, the owners of Whistle Pig Rye have gone public with their decision to consider offers for the Vermont distillery and its stocks of rye whiskey. Bloomberg News first reported the move Thursday night, citing people familiar with the situation at Whistle Pig. Well, we confirmed it on Friday with Whistlepig master distiller Dave Pickerel, who also owns a small equity stake in the company. What's the story here? Is this uh, is it up for sale? Well, uh, you know, we'd be foolish not to not to entertain offers. You know, there there we have been contacted by some folks that that have expressed interest, and and uh, um, at, at this point in time, we're 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 not closing the door and saying no. I mean, that's the easiest way to say it is that, so I guess that means we're entertaining offers right now. And I have to ask, does this have anything to do with the, uh, the court fight last fall that sort of ended uh, rather quietly? Um, I, I don't, I, while, while I wouldn't say that they're mutually exclusive events, um, you know, when you get a company in, you know, we're in a feeding frenzy right now in the, in the world, in the craft spirits world. Um, and when you've got a company like Whistle Pig that's doing well and has got a good reputation and great products, it's only a matter of time before people start looking to buy. And uh, um, so, you know, whether there had been anything, any kind of fluff or all, I, I think it's immaterial. I think we were going to get to this point anyway. Any idea what they're looking for in terms of money? I know you're not going to say, but... Uh... If, yeah. you, if you start yeah. if, if you start looking at uh, if you start looking at numbers uh, like the uh, what was it about 160 million that Constellation paid for High West and and some of those deals that have come down over the last year or so, I got to figure Whistlepig might be worth upwards of 200 at least. Um, you know, you you can do that. You know, I'm not a I'm not an expert on the financial stuff, and you know, my my deal is that that I make really good whiskey and hope people love drinking it. And, uh, um, but, uh, you know, you can, you know, the, the numbers are out there. You can, you can kind of figure them, you know, there's pluses and minuses, you know, how, how broad your distribution, how much whiskey do you have in the warehouse? What's your sale? What's your price point? You know, all that kind of stuff goes into it. And I'm, I'm no pricing genius, but, uh, but 
you know, there are numbers that are out there people can figure. Dave Pickerel declined to say what companies have expressed interest so far. Now, I referred to the legal dispute between Whistlepig founder Raj Bakta and two of his board members during that conversation with Dave. In May of last year, board members Wilco Fossen and Christopher Evison tried to oust Raj Bakta as Whistlepig's chief executive. Bakta filed a lawsuit in Delaware Chancery Court seeking to block that move and claimed that they were trying to actually force a sale of Whistlepig. The case was scheduled for a trial last October, but was removed from the Delaware court's docket with no explanation, indicating that some kind of settlement had been reached. Now, who might be interested in buying Whistlepig, which started making its own whiskey two years ago and has a stockpile of sourced Canadian and American rye whiskies in its Vermont warehouses? Let's look at what can best be described as the usual suspects. I mentioned Constellation Brands during that interview with Dave. Constellation bought High West outright and a minority stake in Catoctin Creek Distillery last year and wants to build a premium spirits portfolio focused on whiskeys. Pernell Ricard bought Smooth Ambler last December and has a New York-based venture capital unit to invest in smaller boutique brands. Beam Centauri has not been active in the acquisition market for boutique whiskies. Sazerac has, though, with its recent deals for the Last Drop Distillers in Scotland and the Popcorn Sutton Distillery in Tennessee to make its own Tennessee whiskey. It's also expected to unveil the revival of the Michael Collins Irish whiskey brand by the end of this year. But CEO Mark Brown told me in an email this weekend that his company is not interested in bidding on Whistlepig. Then, of course, there's Diageo, which made a big splash earlier this week when it agreed to pay $700 million up front to buy Casamigros Tequila from founders George Clooney, Randy Gerber, and Mike Meldman with up to $300 million in incentive bonuses based on future sales. The world's largest spirits company has a market cap of around $74 billion, but may want to focus on completing the Casamigros deal before it looks at any more big acquisitions. So far, Pernod Ricard is the only other company that has responded to our questions about interest in bidding on Whistlepig, with the standard, we don't comment on mergers and acquisition rumors. That's about what I would expect to hear from the others as well. In other news, Chivas Brothers is facing a strike by workers at its main blending and bottling plant in Paisley, Scotland. According to the Daily Record, 76% of Unite's members at Chivas Brothers voted in favor of a strike. Union members overwhelmingly rejected the company's four-year contract offer following a breakdown in mediation talks between the two sides. Unite leaders say there is still a chance to avoid a strike if Chivas Brothers comes back with a better offer. But a company spokeswoman told the newspaper that the current offer is fair and reasonable. Chivas is moving its headquarters from Paisley to Dumbarton in 2019, and that move will affect more than 500 workers. We'll talk about politics later on, but there are a couple of U.S. states where common sense has finally taken hold when it comes to regulating how craft distillers treat their guests. South Carolina lawmakers have approved legislation that allows distillers to use mixers and create cocktails in their tasting rooms, instead of being forced to offer whiskeys neat. And they doubled the amount visitors can be served in a single day, from an ounce and a half to three ounces. The new law eliminates the rule limiting distilleries to selling only 750 ml bottles in their gift shops, and will allow smaller sizes to be sold now. Meanwhile, Iowa distillers are cheering a new state law that takes effect there this coming Saturday. They'll now be allowed to sell drinks by the glass at their distilleries, including cocktails, and guests will now be allowed to buy up to 9 liters of spirits per visit. That's a full case of standard 750 ml bottles. Scotch whiskey exports grew 10% during the first quarter of 2017, from a year ago, according to new statistics released this week by Scotland Food and Drink. Whiskey remains the biggest Scottish export product, with exports valued at $1.1 billion during the quarter. The European Union is still Scotland's largest regional export market for whiskey, followed by North America 
and Asia. Meanwhile, European whiskey distillers are helping to boost spirits exports. According to the Spirits Europe Trade Group, which reports exports grew 5% during 2016. Whiskey accounted for 45% of European spirits exports last year, and the U.S. remains the largest single market for those exports. Whiskies made up 35% of exports to the U.S. last year, outpacing cognac, vodka, and liqueurs. Let's talk about some of the new whiskies announced this week. And we'll start off in Ireland, where Hibernia Distillers has released the Hyde No. 6 President's Special Reserve. It's a blend of 18-year-old Irish single malt and 8-year-old Irish single grain whiskies, finished in Oloroso sherry casks. 5,000 bottles are available for a recommended retail price of 59 euros. That's about $66 each. Aaron is wrapping up its Smugglers series with the third and final annual release, the X Seisman single malt will be released on July 12th and uses Madeira casks. It's bottled at 56.8% ABV, and as with the two previous editions, it comes in a box designed like a hollowed-out book. It'll carry a price tag of 93 pounds, about $118. On the luxury end, a couple of weeks ago I mentioned the Royal Salute Polo edition for the travel retail market. This week, the Chivas Brothers brand unveiled a new Royal Salute 30-year-old The Flask edition, which comes with, you guessed it, a bespoke porcelain flask, funnel, and wooden serving tray. It had its debut in China, but is now available at select retailers worldwide. The price tag, around 800 pounds. That's about $1,020 a bottle. The Whiskey Exchange is offering a new Cavalan single cask bottling, it's a single malt distilled back in 2007 and matured in casks previously used for Isla malts. This is the first time Cavalan has made its peated cask expression available outside of the distillery in Taiwan. It's bottled at 52.4% ABV and will sell for 150 pounds, about $190 a bottle. I received a sample this week. I'll have tasting notes for it soon at whiskeycast.com. Now, I mentioned at the start of this episode that Canada is celebrating its 150th anniversary this coming Saturday. Forty Creek founder John Hall was the first distiller to put Canadian whiskey into Canadian oak casks a few years ago. The result was Forty Creek Confederation Oak. Now, Forty Creek is releasing a commemorative edition of Confederation Oak to mark the anniversary, Calgary artist Sheila Schatzel won a nationwide competition to design the packaging for the limited edition bottling. It'll be available in most Canadian provinces for a recommended retail price of around $70 Canadian. That's about $53 U.S. Last time around, we heard from Balcona's head distiller, Jared Hempstead, who appears to be pretty good at keeping a secret. One thing he and his colleagues never mentioned last week while I was in Waco, a rare French oak single cask bottling of their Texas single malt that went on sale this weekend exclusively at the distillery. It's 38 months old, and that makes it the oldest single malt release yet from Balconis. It's bottled at 64% ABV. Only 180 bottles are available. No word on pricing. Meanwhile, Charlie and Andy Nelson at Nelson's Greenbrier Distillery in Nashville, Tennessee, will be releasing their first whiskey distilled in-house on July 4th, resurrecting their family's longtime Tennessee whiskey recipe using a wheat-focused mash bill instead of rye. Nelson's first 108 will be available in two versions exclusively at the distillery, a green label blend using many of the 108 30 gallon barrels they laid down two years ago, bottled at 45% ABV. And there's also a gold label single barrel version that's bottled at cask strength. Once those are gone, that'll be it until 2019, when the first release is scheduled for four year old Nelson's Greenbrier, matured in full size 53 gallon barrels. By the way, there is another significance to the number 108 on the label. It not only refers to those 108 barrels of whiskey, but the 108 years since Prohibition in Tennessee forced their great-great-grandfather to close his distillery back in 1909. 
And Brown Foreman is also giving a nod to its heritage with a new limited edition release of its Early Times Bourbon. This one is a bottled-in-bond bourbon that recalls the 75th anniversary of the old Early Times bottled-in-bond bourbon that was released after Prohibition. It'll be available starting next month, but only in Kentucky, Indiana, Ohio, Illinois, Michigan, and Oregon. The price tag? $22.99 for a one-liter bottle. And finally, I'm shaking my head at the latest horror story from the world of golf. No, it was not the video of President Donald Trump driving his golf cart right onto the green at his golf course in northern New Jersey the other day. Believe it or not, this one is even worse. Brooks Kepka won last weekend's U.S. Open at Aaron Hills in Wisconsin, and of course that's a reason to celebrate. But a photo of Kepka pouring whiskey into the U.S. Open trophy that turned up on Instagram is reason to shake your head. Nothing wrong with pouring whiskey into the trophy. It's just that he poured a bottle of Fireball whiskey into it. It's probably worth noting that he started the party off with a photo of the trophy next to a 12-pack of Michelob Ultra beer in his limo. Michelob Ultra and Fireball. Oy, if he wins the Open Championship at Royal Birkdale next month and tries that with the Claret Jug, all hell might just break loose. You can keep up with the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. The news is brought to you by Highland Park, the Orkney single malt with Viking Soul, and a brand new website. Check it out today at highlandparkwhiskey.com. Redbreast fans have always cherished our whiskey's sherry notes, so we set out to embellish that character. Introducing the Redbreastless Stow Edition, a quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey finished in first fill Oloroso sherry casks from Spain's prestigious Bodegas Listeo. Carrying Redbreast's trademark pot still spices and dark dried fruit notes, the Listeo edition is graced with an enduring sherry finish that will be better described as a final act. Discover the newest branch on the Redbreast family tree. Redbreast Lustau is now the latest award winning member of the Redbreast family. It is Whiskey Advocates 2016 Irish Whiskey of the Year. Try a bottle for yourself. I mentioned last week's interview with Balconis Distillery's Jared Hempstead a couple of minutes ago. Now you can get a look at both the new distillery and the original one underneath the 17th Street Bridge in Waco. Jared took us back to the old distillery for the latest episode of Whiskey Cast HD. Here's a sample. So when we made those condensers, those things are pretty heavy. I never put them on a scale to weigh them. But when we had them done, we took this down, and I think we had three or four people up on the platform and a couple people down here and some ratchet straps. And obviously it was congested, so people were standing everywhere, and it still took a good six people to get those up. They were so heavy. And uh, we had already built little cradles for them. And, man, that last few inches was... uh, Every time we did it, I just thought somebody surely was going to throw their back out or drop it on their foot or something. And we had already built this platform for the mash tun before we put the mash tun in, and the auger was already in place. So we really had like a three quarters inch or so on each side. We rigged up this crazy like skid system with these really long uh, like two by twelves or I don't remember how big they were, and literally seesawed it. We had people. I was one of the people hanging off the other end as we like slid it up and then straightened it out like right at the last second. It was pretty another very sketchy situation that I can't believe no one got hurt doing. You can watch WhiskeyCast HD videos on YouTube or at WhiskeyCast.com, and you can download them from iTunes. Let's open up the inbox now for this week's Your Voice. Heard from a couple of whiskey clubs this week, the Whiskey Squad in London and the Madison Single Malt Society in Madison, Wisconsin, which even has a Burns Night celebration every January, complete with Wisconsin-made haggis. We've added the websites for both clubs to our Whiskey Clubs page in the Resources section at WhiskeyCast.com. It didn't take long for the comments to start coming in after we posted our Whistlepig Rye story at the website Friday, like this one from longtime whiskey blogger Steve Urey on Twitter. Whistlepig for sale. But will they take Canadian dollars? 
Of course, that's a slightly snarky reference to the whiskey's original origins in Canada at Alberta Distillers. And there was some controversy about the labeling of Whistlepig's whiskeys several years ago. We addressed that with Whistlepig founder Raj Bakta in an October 2015 interview. From the beginning, in any point of press, whenever asked, uh, the question have been fully transparent about where it's from, and I think the confusion came with you know our labeling change that came a couple of years after we started operation, where the TTB said you know it's a domestic product, so we put domestic, and they changed their mind, we put it back, but it's all about the whiskey in the bottle, not necessarily where it's from. You can listen to the entire interview with Whistlepig founder Raj Bakta in episode 560 of Whiskey Cast. It's in the archives at whiskeycast.com. Lloyd Fink, at Lloyd927 on Twitter, saw my very early ballpark estimate on Twitter of potentially between $180 and $200 million for Whistlepig and tweeted this, That would make many investors happy. Raj built a good rye name. It'll be interesting to follow for sure. Now, Russ Kempton, at That Whiskey Guy on Twitter, had this to say about the new WhiskeyCast HD episode from Balconis. I visited the old distillery and remember how rustic, downturned, and unique the site was, plus how great the whiskeys were tasting. Old school. Thanks, Russ. It's always good to be able to either confirm rumors that are going around on social media or knock them down once and for all. This week, Daniel Weber at DAW816 on Twitter sent along this question. I've seen rumors that Heaven Hill Bottled and Bond is losing its six-year age statement, but also seen contrary statements. Have any light to shed? I passed Daniel's question along to the folks at Heaven Hill. Their response was almost eloquent in its simplicity. Not happening. Gave Daniel that news. His response, perfect. Thanks, Mark. You're awesome. Well, I wouldn't go that far, but I'm glad to help, Daniel. Jess at Jess Lyons, Maine on Twitter posted this note from Glasgow after returning to Scotland from a trip to the U.S. Other weird things I've noticed since I landed this afternoon, Glasgow's water tastes so much better than anything I had in the U.S. Well, of course it does, Jess. That's because there's usually whiskey in it. Now, if you have something you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always post it on the Your Voice page at whiskeycast.com or track us down on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr at WhiskeyCast. And my email address is comments at WhiskeyCast.com. You don't need a special occasion to open a bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label. But when you have a special occasion, why not celebrate with a specially engraved bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label? Here's how one whiskey lover celebrated his team's recent success. He arranged to have 108 specially engraved bottles of Johnny Walker Blue Label made for his co-workers. You might say he hit a home run. Just like a perfectly executed double play, Johnny Walker Blue Label is smooth and well-rounded, and unlike a trophy, never needs polishing. Support for WhiskeyCast comes from Johnny Walker. Visit johnnywalker.com to find out more about engraving options near you. Johnny Walker Blue Label Blended Scotch Whiskey, 40% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo, North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Time now for the calendar of events brought to you by Wyoming Whiskey. The Aaron Malt and Music Festival is this coming weekend in La Cranza, Scotland, along with the Corsets Whips and Whiskey Festival at Journeyman Distillery in Three Oaks, Michigan. The distillery's building used to house a corset factory, and a buggy whip maker back in the day. Catoctin Creek Distillery has its summer seafood boil July 7th in Purcellville, Virginia. The Proof Washington Distillers Festival is coming up on July 8th in Seattle. Westport Whiskey and Wine in Louisville, Kentucky hosts Al Young of Four Roses for a tasting of his 50th anniversary bourbon on July 18th. The Wild Ponies will lead their annual bus trip along the Kentucky Bourbon Trail July 21st through the 23rd. And the National Whiskey Festival is July 22nd in Edinburgh, Scotland. Right now, we have 141 different events on the searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com. There's bound to be something going on near you. 
The calendar of events is brought to you by Wyoming Whiskey. There's a whiskey. It hails from the west. Kirby, Wyoming in the Bighorn Basin to be precise. Crafted from only Wyoming natural ingredients. And water from a limestone aquifer that lies a mile below the ground. It then spends five years in the barrel in the most unique maturation environment in the world. All under the careful eye of our distiller Sam Mead. The result? A singular bourbon that will disappear and live forever. Wyoming Whiskey. The Whiskey of the West. Whiskey Cast In Depth is brought to you by Lagavulin. In just a few minutes, we'll catch up with Dr. Don Livermore of Canada's Hiram Walker Distillery on his tour across the country for Canada's 150th anniversary. But first, more than 45 distillers were in Washington, D.C. this week for the Distilled Spirits Council's annual public policy conference and to do some lobbying of their own with members of Congress. The Trump administration's proposed budget for fiscal year 2018 cuts funding for the Treasury Department's Alcohol and Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureau, the TTB, by 7%. It also eliminates an extra $5 million in supplemental funding that's been in place for the last two years to help shorten the waiting time for processing label and formula applications. The budget also eliminates all funding for the Agriculture Department's Market Access Program, That program is designed to promote exports of U.S. agricultural products, and the Distilled Spirits Council has received funding from that program in recent years to help cover the cost of its export promotion programs. At the same time, there is also a coordinated push among distillers, brewers, and winemakers to get Congress to cut federal excise taxes on alcohol. Mark Gorman is the Senior Vice President of Government Relations for the Council, And in between trips to Capitol Hill this week, he spent a few minutes on the phone with me. We spent uh, two afternoons up on Capitol Hill, probably did about at least 100 meetings. And uh, the two issues we brought up uh, were uh, uh, federal excise tax uh, reductions. Uh, That was primary. The second one uh, is the uh, proper funding for the uh, Tax and Trade Bureau, the TTB, especially uh, with regard to the... uh, extra $5 million line item that they have had in order to um, expedite uh, approvals of uh, labels and and formulas. And uh, that has proven to be a great success over the last couple of years, ever since it's been in the uh, the budget. They've gotten uh, label approvals down to a week or 10 days at the most. And, uh, you know, whereas uh, before uh, they were, uh, could have been a couple of months. In, in processing. So that, that was important. That's important to all the distillers. I think it's important to all the uh, wineries and, and brewers as well. And the, there's a tremendous recognition about, you know, the, the rapid growth of the industry and the need to bring new products online um, and into the marketplace as uh, expeditiously as can be done. And so we felt like our, uh, our request was receiving uh a very favorable attention, so we'll, we'll follow through on it and try to make it happen. Uh, the second one on the, on the MAP program, we had uh, uh, a good number of uh, both large and small distillers who have participated with us in the market access program in, in countries all over the world. I, I think we're, I think we stand a good chance of uh, having that reauthorized, re- refunded. Um, the uh, administration's budget doesn't include market access funds, but uh, it's, there's pretty strong support for it in Congress, so we're optimistic. Why do you think the administration zeroed out the MAP program in the first place, given that uh, they're trying to actually improve American exports and trying to reduce the uh, trade imbalance with our trade partners? Well, you make a good point. It uh, it really has been effective uh, uh, over the years for a lot of industries, including ours. Um, but uh, I think the administration is just looking to cut as much out of the budget as they possibly can to get toward a, uh, a you know, a, a balanced budget. So that would be very hard to do. $5 million doesn't go very far, but I guess you got to do a lot of different things in order to bring the budget under control. So there are detractors from the program as well. Senator McCain, for instance, thinks that uh, the market access program 
is uh, like corporate welfare. I think he's characterized it that way a couple of times. We obviously don't agree with that, don't believe that. Uh, but, uh, you know, they were looking for various ways to cut the budget that might uh, receive support in some corners of Congress. And I guess they figured that was uh, that was one they could throw on the pile. And the same thing with the TTB. That's an agency that generates billions for the Treasury. I don't, I don't understand why they would consider cutting it, but uh, maybe have they given any explanation for cutting the TTB funding other than just regulatory cuts? No, they were just trying to cut something out of every um, every agency, really. And uh, this was probably, uh, they probably looked at it and thought, this extra $5 million that's gone toward uh, uh, labels and, and formulas, uh, it was uh, initially uh, conceived of as a two-year deal, and two years is up, uh, but it was a very successful experiment, and so we're appealing to them to continue it. When you talk to the folks on the Hill, is there a consensus that uh, these cuts will not survive in the final budget? Or is, there, is it too soon to tell? Well, I think it's too soon to tell. I, I, I think the, the administration's uh, budget is, um, you know, going to, it might, might be a starting point, but it's certainly not a finishing point uh, for uh, what Congress is going to do this year. Uh, things are so unpredictable right now with, uh, you know, a new administration that does business uh, differently than most administrations have. And, uh, you know, so the process will have to work its way, but uh, we feel good about, you know, succeeding in the process. How do you feel overall about this administration? I know when I talked with uh, Craig Naz at the uh, economic briefing at the beginning of the administration in early February, He was excited and thought this was going to be a good administration for the spirits industry in general. Have we seen any signs of that happening yet, given these cuts? Well, you know, we've been in to talk to them um, about uh, the uh, federal excise tax uh, reduction. Uh, We felt uh, Craig was in a meeting uh, with some uh, officials at the White House where he thought that was getting a very favorable uh, reception. Uh, where we look at the uh, opportunities in the trade area, which is of increasing importance to uh, to our members. And uh, even though they uh, decided to uh, renegotiate NAFTA and uh, not to pursue the uh, multilateral agreements in, in Asia and in Europe at this time, you know, they do have a strategy, and, and it's to uh, engage in bilateral trade agreements, which is one-on-one agreements with our trading partners. And there's plenty of room for uh, for us to achieve uh, some uh, positive results uh, for the industry uh, in trade as well. Uh, you know, these are a couple of relatively small government programs you're, you're referring to. And, uh, you know, I, I think that... Uh, Because they're not big and uh, impactful in the budget, we feel like we'll have a a pretty decent chance to uh, make sure they're uh, funded uh, properly and, you know, are there to to benefit our members who can use them. Now that you have distilleries in virtually every state making uh, spirits, uh, does that make it uh, easier to get a good reception up on the Hill when you're uh, telling members of Congress that, hey, this affects people in your district now? Absolutely. It really does, uh, Mark. The... Uh, the reception that uh, you that we get as lobbyists here in Washington uh, to walking in uh, the senators and congressmen's offices uh, with local distillers in in our company is is really great. I mean, everybody wants to talk about uh, this new this new uh, development in the spirits uh, industry. They uh, love to hear the story about uh, these. Uh, entrepreneurs who are doing something new and different it's it's uh it really opens doors and it makes people sit up and listen and and we're grateful for that taking advantage of it by the way the so-called beer bill is on hold right now even though it has widespread support in congress it's not expected to be brought up for votes until after congress deals with health care tax reform and infrastructure funding along with the four trillion dollar federal budget Now, let's turn to Canada, which celebrates its 150th anniversary as a country this Saturday, July 1st, on Canada Day. 
The anniversary is being celebrated in various ways all over Canada, and Dr. Don Livermore, the master blender at Corby's Hiram Walker Distillery in Windsor, Ontario, has been doing some celebrating of his own this week. He's been traveling across Canada from west to east for tastings of the J.P. Weiser's 150 Commemorative Series Whiskey, and he wound up his tour in St. John's, Newfoundland, which is where I finally tracked him down. We've partnered with uh, Edible Canada, which has an excursion with some top chefs in Canada where we've had some authentic food at various places. We started out in Vancouver and we went to uh, Whitehorse and Yellowknife in Iqaluit. Uh, and uh, I'm now in St. John's at the moment. And uh, it, it is a, a food uh, with pairing with some whiskeys and it was called the Cross the Top of Canada. So I've got to see some unique places this week. Certainly it is the land of the midnight sun. I can certainly attest to that. <laughs> the sun did not go down in some places, but uh, it was quite the excursion and, and some interesting foods, uh, certainly native to Canada. Such as? Well, I had seal for the first time <laughs> and elk uh, and caribou. Um, we certainly had uh, native fish uh, to the er- uh, area. Uh, I had actually opportunity to go even uh, northern pike fishing in Yellowknife and I caught, caught a uh, 42-inch pike, uh, which was an extraordinary experience. And this all leads up to uh, Canada 150 uh, coming up uh, on July 1st, uh, next Saturday. Yeah, this this is what this uh, group had put together is to that celebration for Canadians and the group that we were, we were with. We're very excited about, uh, about that. And uh, we're finishing uh, off tonight here in, um, in Newfoundland at dinner at uh, one of the top restaurants uh, with a chef. And uh, we're going to be tasting some of our exclusive releases that we're going to be uh, doing in the fall of this year. So it should be, it should be a nice event. And we've talked about those exclusive releases before back in January, but let's talk That's about right. the uh, the Canada 150 bottling of Weiser's that you did. Yeah, okay. This is what uh, we wanted to offer a special release for the uh, Canadian um, uh, whiskey consumer. So uh, this is a 16-year-old whiskey, or I like to sometimes say 16 and a half. It was a bond of whiskey we chose that was uh, put away from the year 2000. It is traditional, lighter style, smoother Canadian whiskey, um, typical of Weiser's. Um, certainly the grain certainly came from all of Canada. Uh, we aged a good portion of it in brand new virgin oak. Uh, a little bit of rye to it. Um, from the tastings I've done this week, the reception of this whiskey has been exceptional. It's nice vanilla caramel toffee notes, little, little end rye, a little bit of that orange blossom honey I like uh, to see in that. Um, it's a fantastic release and what makes this unique is as well as that we've launched 7,827 bottles mark um and it's a it's done for the reason of it represents a week of each year that canada has been uh, a country <laughs> so and who did the research we, on that uh, who did the re- I can't take credit for that part of it. Obviously, uh, I make the whiskey side of it. Um, uh, so the marketing and brand team uh, numbered the bottles from 0001 all the way to 7,827. And they have dated it the Monday uh, of each week, at the start of each week. So certainly I, I was uh, looking for the one that was important to me, which is uh, November 6, 1972. Um, the week of my birthday, so I happen to have that bottle. But we are finding that, which is the fun part of that, we're starting to see consumers uh, take these off the shelves, trying to trade for the certain weeks uh, that are important to them. Uh, and it's it, it's really going quickly. i just seeing it across my social media at the moment, Mark, that uh, a lot of people are scrambling to find bottles of this. And, and when we did bottle it, it was a fun day to just watch the bottling go down the line. It was all randomized numbers as well. So we wouldn't end up with in Newfoundland here of 0001 and 0002. And likewise in British Columbia, it is totally random all across the provinces uh, uh, in Canada. You mentioned the uh, exclusive series that we uh, talked about in Victoria back in January. What's the latest on that, and when might we see those whiskeys? 
Um, they're they're going to be in the fall. I do know the uh, bottling schedule has been confirmed upward, uh, running in the third to fourth week of July. Um, so that's going to be the cast strength lot 40. Uh, it's going to sit in around, we don't know yet because we haven't brought the drain in, but around the 55% uh, alcohol. It's going to be a 12-year um, release. Um, the other one is a Gooderham & Warts Little Trinity. It is a 17-year um, three-grain blend of corn, rye, and wheat. Um, the uh, third one will be a Pike Creek, 21-year-old, uh, finished in a Speyside malt cask. And the fourth one will be, um, which the fourth one? <laughs> the fourth one was... The oh, Weisers, 35-year-old? Yeah, the five-year-old J.P. Weisers. Of course, yes, the 35-year-old J.P. Weisers. Um, and that one's just absolutely fantastic. They, and uh, we are going to be tasting them tonight here in Newfoundland with the group that I've done with uh, across Soul. I'm very interested to see what their feedback is, but uh, from what we've tasted so far, it's uh, it's been nothing but extraordinary. Again, it's only going to be 325 cases of each, very uh, exclusive, mostly to part of Canada uh, and maybe a little bit into the U.S. and uh, in the digital uh, world as well for ordering it. So I should be excited to see how quickly those will, will be going for as well. This is part of a, a real renaissance in Canadian whiskey, and we've talked about this before. Uh, a few years ago, you would never have thought of a, uh, a 35-year-old Canadian whiskey even putting one on the market, if if one even existed. But uh, we're really seeing from from Corby's and from the rest of the Canadian distillery industry, a lot of you guys have really stepped up your game here and are really releasing some cool stuff. Uh, and maybe it is a little bit of the pairing with uh, the Canada 150-year celebrations. Uh, as your audience may know, it's uh, July 1st is Canada's 150-year birthday, and, and, I, and I think it's it's good timing. Uh, it's it's going to be a good celebration in Canada, and I, I firmly believe, you know I do, Mark, that Canadian whiskey certainly has great quality whiskeys, the the versatility, we, we got a great innovation, innovative platform and we can adapt to what consumers' uh, tastes are. We can go from light, smooth whiskey to 100% rise like Lot 40 uh, and bring in those tastes what consumers are looking for. Just even this week, as I personally went through it this week, a lot of the consumers that, that were on our trip with Edible uh, Canada Man, I didn't really think of Canadian whiskey that way, and I'm going to go home and buy a bottle. And I think we're starting to wake up a little bit. And we're and you're you're absolutely right when you say there's a renaissance and there's some excitement. And uh, we certainly uh, certainly believe that Canadian whiskey does have a great reputation and great quality, and and so much so is that the the JP Weiser's dissertation that we released in the LCBO market uh, for this Father's Day. Uh, won the world's top blended whiskey at the World Whiskey Awards uh, about a month ago now, uh, and it is for the limited release. And uh, what a what an exceptional honor to see Canadian whiskey come to the top of that awards. I was about to mention that one because that one had some uh, special meaning for you, didn't it? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> in 2004, the I, I was started my PhD where I was looking at using infrared sensors to measure the quality of a cask uh, on the inside of a barrel. Because it's one of the issues we face as blenders is, well, what do previous casks, what, are they, what is it going to give you? And uh, it was something that uh, I was able to do in my PhD. And um, there was 114 barrels left over from that experiment, which we typically would have just put into our pool of different blends of various things. But, you know, I was playing with different ryes and different pot stills and different columns, distillates and um, different uh, burn uh, layers of barrels and stuff. I know you've had an opportunity to sit on my master classes before, but what do you do with all that spirit? So um, we've partnered with the LCBO to do a limited release series for every Father's Day. And they said, oh, what a perfect perfect thing to to launch is a um, a master blender myself uh dissertation and that's exactly sometimes i've described this whiskey as opening up your refrigerator and putting all your leftovers together the intent was never uh to do a blended whiskey when i started my phd it was all about finding that quality that barrel uh, making exceptional whiskeys but we, we decided to put it together um and we released it um and the fun and the cool part maybe it's a little bit the personality that i have mark is we decided to put the strength at 46.1%. When I was sitting down with my blender, uh, his name's Scott, Scott and I were talking, and usually the last thing we decide is the strength of alcohol when we do a release. And 
we sat there talking back and forth and we go, you know, Scott, it's quite obvious to me why it's got to be 46.1. He goes, why would you put it at 46.1? I said, Scott, that's the molecular weight of ethanol. If you add all the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygens together, it adds up to 46.1. This is the J.P. Weiser's dissertation. It is about education. It is about learning. And here, here is an interesting scientific pun to put the strength at 46.1. Oh, brother. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> it's kind of it's interesting, and it, it does fit because it is a very rye forward whiskey. Um, and uh, it's certainly the higher strength if you want to emphasize a rye. Uh, we certainly want to bring that out, out on it. And I must say to just one more point on this one, when I started the PhD um, back in uh, 2004, it really was a stepping stone or a platform to a lot of the releases that Corby has done. Um, you know, without doing that work, we, we would have never moved Lot 40 into the brand new Virgin Oak, or we, we would have never did uh, J.P. Weiser's Red Letter or J.P. Weiser's Small Batch uh, or even Gooderham and Warts. It, it, it was a stepping stone, uh, an innovation that certainly changed to some award-winning whiskeys that Corby has made. Don, the 46.1 takes whiskey nerddom to a new level, I think. Well, that's what I said. It's a little bit of that personality coming through on it, but uh, I, 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 I just thought, well, how cool was cool was that uh, to to put that at forty six point one? And it, and you know what? It is it is nerdum. You know, I, I've had a few comments from a number of people said that that's so cool, and and and, and they think it. You know, we we does that even add a value to it? You know what? It's the fun part of what we do, Mark. I'm not saying it's not cool. It's just it's it's going a little far, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, like I said, I, obviously I'm passionate about what I do, and, and I have fun with with blending whiskeys. And, and here's here's another one. And that that's same thing when we were doing the strength of Gooderham and Warts, and when it's a four grain whiskey, I thought putting the strength at forty four point four was a little bit of a uh, fun and, and as well. <laughs> One other thing I wanted to update, uh, we talked briefly in January about you guys opening up the uh, distillery in Windsor for tours, and you've now yes. done that, correct? Yes, we, we've, we're, we're slowly putting our toe in the, the water, uh, if I best can describe it that way. So we've partnered with a, a local uh, uh, company called Windsor Eats, um, where it is a gentleman that... Uh, uh, has a network of uh, individuals and websites that uh, uh, where they do tours uh, in Windsor with local restaurants or culinary experiences and stuff. And he he, he does um, an event called the the Drinks of Walkerville, where they um, will uh, charge a fee uh, of uh, uh, on a Saturday afternoon. They start at the Hiram Walker Distillery, and then they will go over to the Walkerville Brewery, and then they end the afternoon with lunch at one of the uh, local restaurants and. Uh, we opened it up um, you know, to three events. Well, let's try it, see what whether people are interested in it. But he opened it up within five hours. We had three events sold out completely. Um, and it was extraordinary uptake of what even local or even the, into the Michigan, uh, Ohio market as well. Uh, he even had somebody as far away as Florida sign up uh, as to have the interest of the Walkerville. Uh, the, the, it, it ends up being a great afternoon. We can You can look at it up on TripAdvisor as well. Um, uh, we do show the inside of it and we do taste four of our, our whiskeys that we make here. And then they, they certainly move on to the other. And I think this is where uh, we got to look at Walkerville and Hiram Walker the distillery. Uh, you know, we were there before Canada was a country. We really want to get out and tell our story. We do make uh, good stuff. We have, you know, 350 employees that work at our distillery. We do want to show off the good things that we do in Canada. And thanks to Dr. Don Livermore of Corby's Hiram Walker Distillery for spending some time this week with us on Whiskey Cast in Depth, along with Mark Gorman of the Distilled Spirits Council of the U.S. And that's this week's Whiskey Cast in Depth, brought to you by Lagavulin, where patience has been awarded. Lagavulin 25 is Whiskey Advocates' Isla Single Malt of the Year. This 25 year old whiskey, matured exclusively in sherry casks, is a recognition of the distillers that have crafted Lagavulin across the years. Learn more at malts.com. And just a reminder that if you're in the Houston area, I'll be leading a tasting July 25th at Reserve 101 downtown. Tickets are $20 each, 
100% of the proceeds will go to the Rescued Pets Movement. You can get more details at Reserve101.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. And in honor of Canada's 150th anniversary, let's look at some Canadian whiskeys this time around. We'll start with another one of Don Livermore's creations, the J.P. Weiser's Triple Barrel Rye, which blends rye whiskey distilled in a column still with wheat whiskeys from both column and pot stills. And as you might guess from the name, uses three different types of casks in maturation. It's bottled at 45% ABV. The nose is spicy and aromatic with hints of cinnamon, chili peppers, dill, and just a touch of linseed oil. The taste is peppery and powerful with cinnamon, chili peppers, linseed oil, and hints of honey and vanilla, while the finish is long and slightly flinty with good lingering spices. I'm scoring the J.P. Weiser's Triple Barrel Rye an 87. Next up, the second release in Crown Royal's Noble Collection. It's wine barrel finished whiskey using California Cabernet Sauvignon casks from the Paso Robles region. It's bottled at 40.5% ABV, and the nose is nice and warm with red grapes, a touch of plum, subtle spices, and just a hint of red apples. The taste has a good balance of sweetness and spices with clove, allspice, caramel candy, and touches of red grapes, vanilla, and butterscotch. The finish has a lingering hint of clove, along with touches of raisins, anise, and butterscotch. It's a nice one. I'm scoring the Crown Royal Wine Barrel Finished Canadian Whiskey an 89. I'll get back to the tasting notes in a minute. But first, this week's tasting notes are brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. Family owned and operated since 1935, Heaven Hill remains fiercely independent and committed to the traditions and history of American whiskey with an award-winning range including Evan Williams and Elijah Craig Bourbons, and Rittenhouse and Pikesville Rise. Meet the whole family at HeavenHillDistillery.com. Now, when we think of sour mash whiskeys, we usually think of bourbons and rice. But the folks at Yukon Spirits in Whitehorse, Yukon, tried adding some spent mash back into the fermenters with a batch of their peated single malt. The result? Two Brewers Single Malt Release 5. It's bottled at 45% ABV, and the nose is malty with a subtle smokiness, baked apples, just a touch of dill, smoked salmon, and hints of melons and tropical fruits in the background. The taste is smoky and peppery and builds up to a crescendo of allspice, apricot, a hint of pears, cinnamon baked apples, and a subtle oakiness. The finish is long and smooth with lingering smokiness and spices, along with a subtle hint of lemon zest. I'm scoring the Two Brewers Single Malt Release 5 from Yukon Spirits, a 92. And that's the What I'm Tasting This Week department, brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. I'll be adding these tasting notes to the searchable list of 1,900 different whiskeys at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find the latest whiskey news, events, and much more including a complete archive of past episodes. Let's keep the cask strength conversation going all week long. I'm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr at WhiskeyCast, and my email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. I'd love to hear from you. WhiskeyCast, brought to you by Redbreast, the definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, no red breast. You don't need a special occasion to celebrate with something truly unique. But a personally engraved bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label can make any occasion special. Support for Whiskey Cast comes from Johnny Walker. Visit johnnywalker.com to find out more about engraving options near you. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2017, and comes to you each week from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.